Yo, yo. Check. What's up, everybody? Welcome to... Yes. We're back. Good to be back on this rainy, rainy Saturday. It is storming here, pouring rain. Not a very good day outside, but... Luckily, we got a nice space for a nice podcast. Big episode today, episode 27. 27 episodes, that's crazy. Big guest, former uh, colleague, I guess you could say. We went to high school together, Emma Fitzer Price. She went to New York, studied at Juilliard, studied theater, acting. Super, super dope, super big show. Lots to discuss, lots to discuss. Uh, yeah, first things first, my email list. I think I might have talked about this last week, but uh, I'm having some trouble. Some people are getting the emails, and then some people aren't. There's something going on with my uh, server, so I'm working on that. Uh, but I've been sending emails, again, as some of them people have been getting them, but some people haven't. So I'm going to keep working on that, figuring that out. Um, there was something else really important that I wanted to say. should have written it down. Oh, I'm going to Florida next week. My birthday is next Friday. I'm spending some time with some good friends down there in Boca Raton. So that's going to be nice. It'll be a nice, you know, break from reality, take off, break from the podcast, break from making music and delivering packages. It'll be nice. We'll be down there for about six days. We leave on Monday. That's going to be super nice. Excited for the sun. You know, all that. But, yeah, so, other than that, that's pretty much it. But, yeah, so Emma and I went to high school together at Y-Pass. She was in theater. I was in band. Um, yeah, that's pretty much pretty much all I got for that. She's got a lot of good, we got a lot of good discussion planned. So, with other than that, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other small announcements. Oh, uh, Jack Harlow is on SNL tonight. I know that he's hosting, so that'll be cool. I'm trying to watch that. Mm, I think that's it. I'll go ahead and get Emma in here. Let's give her a ring. Hey, Emma. Hello, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Welcome to Lush Louisville. Amazing to Thank have you. you. Yes. yes. Right. How are you today? I am so good. There, There is not one cloud in the sky. It's really? 60 something degrees. Uh, my dog is peacefully sleeping on the sofa and it's gonna be a great Saturday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like you're on your way to a great Saturday. Can't ask for that. Yeah. Well, it is pouring rain here and storming. No, uh, yeah, no. Had a tornado. But no, well, we did the other night. Whenever, remember, whenever me and you were talking on the phone, there was like the power went out, and then yeah. there was it was a tornado warning, I think, but there never was. And then yesterday was super nice, and then today it's just storming. So, Thanks. but hey, we got a great podcast, a great episode, so can't can't complain. So, um, Emma, I kind of gave everybody just a little bit of rundown of who you are and what you do, but kind of give us just a little bit of, you know, a background on, I guess, who you are and what you do, but your background in Louisville and kind of where you came from, things like that. Sure. So I, I grew up in Huntington, West Virginia, which is like mm -hmm. this really small town in hey, Appalachia nice, where like everyone is, you know, either from a family of doctors or a family of coal miners, or you're like, a hippie bluegrass musician activist and that's how you wound up there <laughs> huh. and so i grew up there for the first seven years of my life and then i my family moved to louisville um which was sort of like the middle distance between huntington and st louis where my mom's side of the family is from so we would always as a kid we would drive through louisville um and just like drive through the downtown area and I remember as a kid just being like wow like what is this concrete jungle of what are these skyscrapers like, what is this yeah. yeah and you know now that I've met now that I have some friends in um towns that are smaller 
um, deeper in Appalachia, they're like, oh no, Huntington is like, that is a big town. So yeah. it's funny how like that, how that perspective sort of changes. But yeah, I, I moved to um, Louisville when I was, yes, yeah, so I was seven or eight and still just kind of had this like boundless imagination, even though I didn't have as much nature around me. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of forced my neighborhood friends to play games with me and like create <laughs> imaginary worlds and okay, you oh, have absolutely. this power and I'm going to be an airbender and you know, Avatar The Last Airbender was very big. <laughs> oh yeah, I remember, I remember. Oh yeah. Favorite show, still my favorite show. It's a great show. Hands down. Um, but yeah, and honestly, that was kind of the start when I think about how I got into theater and performing, the roots of that really lie in those childhood imaginative games mm -hmm. where you're just, you yes, don't care about yes. the neighbors watching you from their window. <laughs> like you are fully in your element and pretending to be someone that is impossible to be in the world that we live in. Um, and so as a kid, I definitely pulled, you know, my little sister and all my neighborhood friends into these imaginary places and worlds we create together. Um, right. And that feels like, you know, the kind of where that creative journey began. started where it first started. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing that you say that because, you know, as, as a kid, you know, literally what you said, you don't care who's watching you're outside, you know, uh, doing your thing and creating all these magical imaginary worlds. I, I, I used to do the same thing, really. I, we had all my neighbors. We would have, you know, wars and Nerf guns and stuff like that. And yeah. all different, and you'd even just like playing football and, you know, just different stuff like that. So that's kind of where you kind of found those roots you, you were saying in, in theater, I guess. So then when, from there, when did you get into like actual like theater or acting or things like that yeah i so one of the first things i my family kind of got me into when we moved to kentucky was i was obsessed with figure skaters like nice. i would watch i think we had just seen the olympics or something and yeah. um i was like obsessed with this skater named yamaguchi and I was like, I want, I want to be that. And so they signed me <laughs> up for these figure skating lessons and I got really into it. And so did my little sister and we started doing competitions. Um, so this was all throughout like elementary school and middle school. Um, and so I did competitions in Ohio and, um, and Kentucky. And I think one was in Tennessee, um, but just sort of like the, our neighboring states. And I like got really into like, you know, the, the energy and like the performative aspect of it and the, the outfits and the dance and, and the yeah. sport, like I'm a, I'm a pretty athletic person. Um, and so it kind of married this, you know, you get to pick your song and like come up with a, a, a character and the choreography. And I got on so well with my coaches and then there came this one day I started doing then, you know, from that, I was like, oh, I love performing. And so my parents put me um, in classes at Walden. So yeah. I, at that point, I was like, or I did that alongside most of the time. So I was nine or 10 when I started at Walden. Um, and I got so into the classes there that I sort of stopped, you know, I, I was doing the competitions, but I think my heart was really in the community I had at Walden because I found figure skating to be sort of isolating unless you were doing like synchronized skating because it's just you, your coach, and like the song that you're creating choreography to. And so I always found it isolating, but at Walden I had this community and network of artists who were like weird like me and I could just play those imaginative games. I had a little more space to do that. That's all we did at at Walden um, and like channeling that kind of creative energy. And so one day I, I think I did like poorly in a competition or something. And then we, I got to the point where if I wanted to get more serious about competing, I would have to come in and practice at like 6 AM 
like before, you know, I was in seventh or eighth grade at this time. Yeah. And so my coach sat down with me and she was like, honestly, Emma, I just want to say, I think you're more into the performative aspect of this sport than you are into like the athletic essence of it. And I was like, I think you're right. And after that, never went to (laughs) figure skating again and just fully invested in Walton. And, um, and then I had a babysitter who went to Y pass and that's where I first heard about that. Okay. Um, and so I applied when I was in eighth grade, like thinking it was a long shot and I was in a Catholic middle school. So all my friends were going to assumption or sacred heart. And so I felt like oh boy. kind of the odd fish that was like, yeah. I want to go to a, a magnet high school and do drama. <laughs> um, and I got in and that's, I ended up going to Emmanuel Y pass and it was such an excellent high school. Um, Cause like we were talking about, you could kind of marry that love for academics and you could take all these great AP classes and be surrounded by students who challenge you and engage you. Um, yeah, that's true. And I just, I loved that in combination with um, having that theater focus. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I agree. Uh, Emmanuel was definitely had a love for academics. I'll say that much. <laughs> the, the, uh, that, but that going back a little bit, what you were saying about when you made the decision kind of to take on drama fully and kind of leave ice or figure skating behind. That's nice though, that your coach sat you down like that and was able to help you realize that that's, yeah. that's a sign of a good coach. Yeah. And a great mentor. She just saw that something that I didn't yeah. see or like want to acknowledge because I felt guilty about it or whatever. But she saw through that and was like, go, go. Yeah. Do you, do you think Emma? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now, so now you're, you're at Y pass and you obviously, you know, you're seeing, uh, the environment that it is. And like you said that that's true. How being around in- individuals, I think when Chris Mikos was on here, we talked about this being around so many creative people and like ch- they're challenging you all the time. And it, it's yeah. so competitive with the different departments that they had and stuff like that. What, what's, uh, I guess you kind of, but what, what was that all like? What did that do? And how did that help you grow as an artist? Um, I think the, like constantly being busy and balancing. I was also working a job. I was working at like Baskin Robbins, Oh yeah, I think two nice. years so I'm going to school there, and so balancing hey, that nice, with Walden, which was after high school, like you know the school day would end at like two mm-hmm. twenty, yeah. and then we'd all carpool and go to Walden, which started at four and would end at like eight o'clock because you have your two hours of classes, then you have a dinner break and then two hours of rehearsal, um, and then the school day was half. You know, I loved those like AP classes and the really challenging um, academics. And then you had your theater classes where, you know, you're changing your clothes, you're sweating, you're getting into it, you're in yeah. the studios. And um, and so I think that at that time, there was just no, there was no time to breathe. Mm-hmm. And for, for whatever reason, I find that really stimulating um, because you don't have any time to like doubt yourself or take a step back. Like you have to just, no matter if you're sleep deprived, vitamin C deficient, like you're <laughs> just, you're young and you're going yeah. and, um, and then you're surrounded. All of your friends are doing the same thing. It's like, you don't um, have time. You don't have time to think you're just doing it. Yeah. You just do. You're just like this ball of activity. Yeah. All the time. Um, oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, I was playing basketball for three and a half years and then doing on top of that Y pass and then the academics. And it was just like, oh, my gosh. But it was fun. It was definitely a blast. Yeah. And it makes you like an adaptable and flexible person. The the mental the mental capacity for like stress that I learned, you know, I can take on a whole lot more now. And it's just that's just how it is, you know. Right. But yeah, that's <laughs> being sleep deprived and and <laughs> like that, especially around finals time in high school, was definitely hungry. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> I, I did not eat forgetting enough. to eat, forgetting to eat was definitely a thing. And so we now, so we'll talk a little bit more about Walden. And 
um, so you had the school day at Manual, and then you'd go to Walden. Um, so you had actual classes at Walden. You weren't just fully rehearsing. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, so the first two hours we would come, and this was, I guess this started happening, you know, when I first joined Walden, it was just called, the level you were in was called like improv. So you were doing a lot of games and all those kids are like nine through 12. Mm -hmm. And then once you're usually around the same time, you're like seventh, eighth grade going into high school. Um, and, and I don't know what the level's called now, um, but you sort of became this, journeyman of sorts and you got more into the muck and you started doing like a lot of Shakespeare and a lot of um, digging into langu heightened language mm -hmm. um, and then taking scene study classes with Charlie, taking voice classes with Emily or Hallie and um, movement and clowning with Julaine. And so you kind of had all these um, different classes that like reached um uh different parts of your artistry and then when you were in high school you also got cast in more shows um yeah and or that was my experience was when that started picking up um and so you're you're kind of taking everything you're learning from those classes and then directly applying it to the rehearsal you're going to have later that night um, and so if we were doing like my third year of high school, we did a checkoff play. We did three sisters. So all of our scene study classes with Charlie were just checkoff, like reading all of his plays, working on Uncle Vanya, working on Cherry Orchard and talking about like that specific style. Um, and then we do the same thing with uh, Shakespeare in the springtime. We always did the Shakespeare festival around Shakespeare's birthday. And so we like really, the spring was just always infused with iambic pentameter and like no, I remember the, the historical that. references and mm -hmm. um, all that good stuff. But I definitely viewed Walden, like when I think about the most important lessons I learned there and what I take away with me today, was the classical training and working and investigating heightened language um, and then activating it in the body. When at Y Pass, my experience was more like, what is the art I want to create? Who am I as an artist in the world? Um, devised work. In our fourth year of high school, we did this awesome thing called Solo Mios, where we had 10 minutes to just do something like yeah, I remember them, yeah. your time. I remember yeah. seeing those. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so much fun. It was like a lot of pressure at the time, but it was important to do before we all went off to college, especially as a lot of us were going to theater schools or art schools, um, just to figure out for yourself, like, what do I want to say? What is my message? How do I put this together? Um, and share it and for it to be engaging and activated. Um, so yeah, those, they were very different. Uh, of course, there were a lot of people who shared those communities, like who would do Y Pass and then we'd all carpool together to go mm -hmm. to Walden. Like there was a huge network of us who balanced both. Um, but I think we all, you know, reap different benefits from both i'm so glad i didn't do just one or just the other yeah it, so um, it sounds like the balance from like the more classical to you know you as like how you want to be as an artist the, the different yeah. training i'm sure that helped immensely yeah and i think something that stuck with me is you know high school was only four years but walden was you know if i ended that when i was 18 or 19 that was 10 years of my life that mm -hmm. i like created yeah. a network and a community in this school and I still talk to my teachers from there I'm still engaged with them um because it just I was there for so long it really feels like if you think about the out just the pure hours spent with that community it's like more hours than I spent with my own family like yeah well it's really I, I, intense it's like this mm -hmm. second home definitely um your solo Mio, didn't you take everybody outside and do like yeah. hopscotch? Okay, I, I remember that. Yeah. I couldn't yeah, remember I if that was everyone... you or. Yeah. That yeah, was fun. Mine was like, 
it was, you know, it, thinking about it, it was like a little mean to the audience because I made them, I like blasted music and I was like, everyone get up. <laughs> but, you know, during those 10 minutes, I, I investigated and wrote a poem about that time when I was a, when I was a kid growing up playing games like hopscotch or things outside with my friends and creating worlds. And um, that's sort of what that was harkening back to. Yeah, definitely. I could see that with the with the hopscotch and the, you know, that's super cool. So yeah. y'all, y'all only had 10 minutes, because I remember seeing, I remember seeing some of those. And you, so you only had 10 minutes to kind of express yourself. Yeah. And then, yeah and, I guess you could say. Yeah. And I remember at the beginning, we were all like, what do you do? You just, you just, you're just you telling me I have to stand there for 10 minutes and like yeah. do something? Like, where do I begin? Right. And a lot of us had, you know, well, that's probably part of the practices. challenge, you know? Yeah. And we, I think one per then one person in our ensemble was assigned to be our director. And the other person was like a stage manager or, or played some other or like designer or played some other role. So I had a director for my piece, but then I was like Drew's director for his. And so we all kind of, took turn we had like a little support group so yeah. it wasn't just you, you and your yeah. like thoughts but yeah cool yeah so yeah it's taking a walk down memory lane here the because we had in in the band at y pass you know we had i mean countless we had to do um i'm trying to give senior from my senior year oh so like we all had the opportunity to audition to do a senior feature and which is like a, a basically a solo that you get to perform with the band at our all one of our concerts your senior year so that was big that was a thing and then of course we had to audition for like all state you know being in the all state yeah. all county and stuff like that and yeah that's that really takes me back but yeah. so you you have gotten an immense training in high school and you know you you you're growing as an artist and you're i mean i'm sure it, it was overwhelming at the end of high school really it was just like wow all this is coming to an end but yeah. then emma you went on to new york and you studied at juilliard correct yeah, yeah. so that was probably I, you know when i got to college after being at manual it was like wow this is super easy like i you know I, i'm the workload i'm prepared for it i know all this like i told you my music theory class the AP class in, in senior year was harder than AP theory one and two in in college, but you know you so you're at Juilliard now. Tell us about that and what that was really like, just being there. <laughs> like, yeah, what was that I like? Mean, I'll, I'll share that application process too. Yeah, for sure. It was so like it I was cannot even imagine really this like very last minute decision. I didn't know where I wanted to go to college really I apply I cast a huge net like an overwhelmingly large net because I was like I'm afraid I'm not gonna get in anywhere so I need to like apply to as many schools as as humanly possible which was a mistake and yeah in some senses. Um, but it, that's a but, that's a common you know yeah going to college is stressful but anyways go yeah. ahead yeah and I feel like, yeah, that was just my nervous reaction was like, I just have to, I have to cover all my bases. Yeah. And so I applied to different kinds of schools, like big schools, small schools. Um, a school I was like really into was Tulane University in New Orleans, because I love that city. And my, my dad is an alum of that school. And they offered like a nice scholarship. So for a while, I was like pretty dead set in my heart of going there and studying architecture and then minoring in theater or like double finding a way to double major. Yeah. Um, and the fact that like that was, you know, a, a potential possibility of what I would have graduated into. It's just a completely would have led to a completely different, it's a totally life. different world. Life. Yeah. And so sort of after I had gotten my main applications in, I remember I was at Quill's coffee shop, which was oh, yeah. like my little like in between high school and in between Walden hub. Yeah. Where I'd get like a, a frilly latte and like think about life um, yeah. and do all do the common app. I was 
I just uh, kind of as like a whim, I looked at Juilliard's website and I saw their application fee was like, you know, however much just to turn in the common app or just to turn in an essay. I'm sure. Yeah. I remember calling my dad and I was like, is this worth it? You know, like this is this is like a great school. I would love to go here, but it's such a long shot. Like, is it worth do you think it's worth going oh, for? Yeah. And my dad said something like really prof if he hadn't have said this, this wouldn't have happened probably. He was like, "Why would you not?" Like yeah. that is the that is the best place to get. You want to be an actor? That is like the place you can go to get the best training in America. Like why would you not? Just just like you know, do it. Yeah. Just pay the fee and do it. Like what do you just have to do lose? It. Yep. Yeah. Um facts. And so I I yes, applied I right there. I hung up and I was like, "Okay, cool." And I applied and you know i think coming from kentucky or um talking to like my our artistic group about that school we all had ideas about what it was i thought it was like this prestigious elitist you know i i thought it was like in iowa in like a cornfield and it was this perfect glass building of like impossibly like quaffed artists <laughs> and their violins like I, I just had very like messed up notions about what that school was mm -hmm. and because of the name and because of the, the weight that it carries behind it. Um, and then I auditioned in Chicago and it was the best audition experience I've ever had in my life. And I was auditioning for like a ton of other schools, Yeah, but I, yeah, I auditioned for Richard Feldman and um, other faculty members and what happened in that room was so magical and I felt like they saw me as a complete and whole artist and not just a monologue package or not just like this overeager high school kid coming in and doing like two different contrasting monologues. Like they, when I got called back that day, they asked me about, they saw that I like to write on my application somewhere and they were like, oh, could you share, you know, it says you did this slam poem competition. Could you share that poem that one of the poems you did in this? And I just sat there with them and I shared this like slam poem that I wrote for Lipstick Wars, which was this slam poem competition that, um, that happened in Louisville. And like, I just felt so seen and heard by these people that my, my ideas of what that school was just out the roof. And then I came to the callback weekend where I spent two days here in New York at the school, taking classes, meeting the professors. Um, and I think there were like 50 of us that got called back to that weekend. Um, and then two days later, I, I was having a day at school and I thought about skipping school because I was so devastated. I was like, I've just met the most beautiful, you know, artistic network that I've ever been exposed to in my life and I'm not going to get into the school yeah. and like my life is over. I'm so sad that I just had this like magical impossible weekend and did the work that like I want to do and I'm hungry to do for the next four years. And then as I was in this like depths of despair, Kathy Hood um, called me on the phone and said that I had gotten into the school and I just like, I was so overwhelmed with, gratitude and from that point on i was like after walking around that school and being a part of the callback weekend there was no other option i was like financially i'm going to do whatever means necessary to make this happen and um and to go here because i've never felt so tied to a place and it yeah, and, and it challenged all notions that I had all of those like, oh, this isn't for a girl from Kentucky, you know, this isn't for me, this isn't this is an impossible thing. Yeah. Um it was just the most humble and grounded um artists that I was so excited to to grow with for four years. Absolutely. That sounds amazing. And yeah. didn't you said you were uh, in Chicago auditioning for multiple schools? Didn't the theater program, didn't you all take a trip to yes. Chicago to do that? Because I remember 
like talking to like Addie and Hallie and everybody, they were saying that they were like all nervous about going to do yeah. that. Yeah, were they? Yeah, they put us up in this hotel. It's called Unifieds, and you just like it's all set up in this hotel room and all the business rooms, and you're surrounded by like high schoolers like stretching in the hallways and doing like <laughs> vocal whatever and you're like oh jesus like i yeah. just i just want to go to college and i just want to like study the art that i'm passionate about and uh, understandable. understandable yeah but it's a stressful Facts. you know yeah. it is so walking into that room i just felt so calm and at ease um and yeah, and those four years there were incredibly challenging and beautiful and chaotic. And I, I think my, my biggest worry when I went there was, you know, I wanted to go to a very kind of continue that love for academics I fostered at Manual. And I was like, if I'm just studying theater for four years, is that going to get lost? Like, how am I going to hold myself accountable for the, the academic education I want to receive. But then, you know, you're put in a class with, my class was 18 people, half MFA. So they were, you know, they had done undergrad. Most of them spent a few years in the workforce or doing something completely different and then had auditioned for the school. Um, and then the other half of the class was undergrad, but we all took classes together. Mm -hmm. um, and so my classmates and the plays we worked on and the drama, the dramaturgy we did for each of those projects, that was my education. And it like sounds wild, but you know, you're sitting there, you're doing table work for a play and then you're reading this like, oh God, I don't know Roman history. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but then there's someone across the table from me who's like, yeah, I studied that in, in undergrad and I took this history class and like, let me fill you in on what I know. And so all those gaps are like my feeling inadequate because I wasn't as old as half my classmates or as experienced. Like that, all of the, that insecurity kind of got taken care of because my classmates were so like humble and willing to use their um, educational resources as like, you know, helping and lifting me up and my younger classmates up instead of like holding it over me or making me feel like inadequate. Um, yeah. And we worked on so many different kinds of plays, plays that were like very physical and bodily and ensemble driven. And then plays that were extremely heady where you're talking for two pages and you're like, how, how do I, <laughs> inform this so that I can engage an audience like I, I need to know what I'm talking about so that they can yeah. I can carry my um, audience with me and yeah so all of that different exposure was like the education exactly the kind of education I wanted to receive I ended up getting that just through the worlds we were diving into that's amazing so that was yeah, I can't even imagine. So now you're you're there and you're you're fu you're fully immersed and you're doing how many how many like shows did you actually do there? Oh, so every six weeks we had a different play project or um, we call them like sharings. So it was like or like a rehearsal showing. Yeah. So for the first two years we wouldn't invite like outside folks, unless it was family or like really close friends, but it was meant to be very private and, you know, cause you want it to be about the work. And so we didn't have any like costumes or sets. We were just doing them in the, the same studios we were rehearsing in and then creating something out of like virtually nothing. And how does that challenge your imagination to, you know, I, I'm sweeping and I need to have a broom. So how do I like, how do you do it that? would be like, I need to book a, a studio for 30 minutes during my lunch break. Cause I need to look in the mirror and like practice miming a, a broom, broom. So it looks realistic. And so I can embody it and imagine what that feels like in my hands and the corners of dirt I'm missing. Like that's, that was a lot of um, that time. 
and then third and fourth year you use all of that kind of like the specificity work and the imaginative work um, and then in those years you're marrying it with the technique that you're learning so you take Alexander class which is about alignment I know a lot of musicians study that too and it's a huge core of Juilliard is like aligning yourself so you can neutralize and take on a character and fully embody it from an, a neutralized place. Huh. Um, and able like vocally, like when you're aligned in Alexander, you're vocally capable to do whatever you need to do because your instrument is completely open. Um, and then technique like our voice work and breathing work. Um, and we took first and second year took a lot of wild, like core, you know, with Daryl's class, um, Daryl Quentin, we did this like workout cardio class for an hour and a half every other day. And just like pure, you know, sweating buckets, <laughs> like just like whipping your body into shape. Yeah. Um, so that you are able, if you have to play Caliban and you're crawling on the ground and you have to like jump up and um, swing on things, like you're like, yeah, I got it. My, I am confident that my body can take on that kind of a character. Um, and so, yeah, so third and fourth year was a mar I found to be a marriage of technique and the technical skill that you were fostering those first um, years. And then your imagination, your creative process, your approach to a character, that, that same, you know, imagination that you're, when you're a kid and you're playing games and you just like, no other care in the world, you were just present and you are on it and you're with your partner, um, and you're fully immersed in every detail of this world you've created together. Um, and so oh. third and fourth year, you get the hair, you get the wigs, you get the makeup, the costumes, like in the pictures I sent you, yeah. like, um, just fill, you get help and kind of filling out that world because you're trusted now to that you could create it without all that extra stuff that audiences expect when they sit down and watch a show. Right. Um, and thankfully we got to do our fourth year wrap, um, before the COVID shutdown. And so we did that rep. So we did, my class did three different plays and then we had two weeks for spring break. And by the time we came back, our school was shut down and we could not access the studios anymore. And New York was, you know, silent. Um, so it was a really interesting, um, it, it's like, don't, one of those moments in life where like you can't take anything for granted yeah. because none of us got to really say goodbye to that building or to that, you know, we did our showcase over Zoom just like this. Like I would talk to you like my scene partner. And that was incredible, like that we got to make that happen. Um, and we did a virtual graduation. But as far as like hugging my classmates who I, they have seen me at my very best and my very, worst, very man. worst for four years. <laughs> like it, it's, you know, it just had to, it had this very brisk ending. Yeah, um, abrupt for sure. Yeah. Man. Well, I want to go back for a second, what you were saying about the class you were taking about um you did the core and cardio workouts in yeah i think it's definitely uh understated the the classes like that or the training you have to have as an actor to do things like that like you were saying like if you had yeah. to crawl around on the ground that's that's really <laughs> interesting things like that i'm sure those classes go a long way and you get fit you know so. yeah yeah <laughs> and it's one of the it's like you know being an actor is so beautiful because you're studying it's the study of like humanity. And, um, and so how do you, that, that school was all about, or my experience there was like, I am bringing 110% of myself to everything I'm doing here. And there's no other option. If I bring 60% of myself, like I can't be Caliban. I can't like, I can't, 
um, be there. I can't hold my ensemble members and like lift them up if I'm not there. And so as much as it's about self-discovery, you have to bring yourself in and just work with a big lesson for me. There was working from where I'm at instead of like, you know, if I come in and I'm like, Oh, sleepy, like, this is hard. I can't do it today. Instead of putting a mask on and being like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to, I'm going to get through it. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Like, how do you work with that? Like, I'm tired. I'm at my wits end, but I'm, I'm going to be present with you and I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to be here for you. And that energy of like, of that, of grace really. Yeah. Was, that was a huge learning curve for me those four years. So that, did you, did you yeah. find yourself doing that? Like often, not, maybe not often, but having to put that mask on like that? Yeah, I think, and you know, maybe that's something I developed in high school that like we were talking about, like the, just get through it, just get, just put the mask on, get through it. Um, but it's this really subtle difference. And like, and because your teachers, they see you so intimately for four years, they know when you're not yourself or when something is yeah, going on, they yeah, know, right? Whether you like it or not, they will corner you and be like, I see you're going through something. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> they know, they know. Yeah. But yeah, it's just like this really subtle um, alteration of like, instead of putting something over that energy, I'm going to acknowledge that's happening, but I'm going to put it into the work I'm doing. So if I'm playing Masha and Three Sisters and I'm having an awful day, how do I take that like mood and kind of infuse it into Masha who's, you know, pining for, she's just like, oh, just get me to Moscow. Like, <laughs> let me be with Rasheen and Rucka just... So how do you infuse, how does like what you are going through as a person, how can you infuse that into the character that you're meeting um, or that you're um, transforming yourself into? Facts. Yeah. So it's like it, from the difference from high school was it's more just like, let's get through it. But now you're actually um, putting it into your work and using it to your yeah. advantage, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So, yeah, so then uh, you you didn't really get a graduation. COVID kind of screwed everything up, say that for everybody, you know. That's just how it was. Um, and you talked to me about how New York had, like, totally changed when you came back from spring break. And first of all, I'm sorry that you didn't get a graduation, that, especially at that, you know, you didn't get to hug your friends and say goodbye. That That's really rough. Um, but the just how did new york change i mean as as vast and big as new york is with covid i can't even imagine just talk a little yeah. bit about that and we had come back from like this incredible we had just had our spring break and my boyfriend and i were in greece and he was also in my um class at juilliard and had just like we the plan was you know we come back we have mainly industry classes and then we fly off to LA to do our showcase. Um, and so we, the, the vacation felt like this, you know, relax completely so that we can come back and ready like, to go. Yeah. Get to work, ready to like jump into the industry. Um, but we came back and the thing that we studied for four years to do is the first thing to shut down. It's like Broadway houses and theaters closed. Um, yeah. and you know, we were getting emails from the, um, school while we were in Greece saying, we're going to go to virtual classes. And I'll say like that school did an incredible job with making like zoom classes, especially yeah. classes fourth years, like helpful and relevant because we, um, adapted our showcase to be on zoom. And I felt like it was helpful for industry folks to see us on like a screen because, a lot of those industry members are looking, you know, they're agents and managers and trying to envision us like in a self tape that they're going to send to casting directors for film and TV. And that's just the way our, our work is turning as these self tapes. 
Right. Um, and so it ended up being this really helpful thing. So we had, you know, we came back and there were things to do. Um, but when you walked outside around New York, it was this really, uh, I'm thinking about it because it was this time last year. And it was this odd juxtaposition of like spring blooming and like that time when the year is usually really hopeful and it's starting to bud and blossom. Yeah, yeah. And then you walk around and it's just like desolate. There's no one. Um, the, everything I love about New York is the collision and the diversity and the bodies and space um, running into people that like you haven't seen in two years, but you run into a corner, like you see them at a stoplight and no other place in the world. Like it feels like that kind of thing happens or just even just as much as I complained about it at the time, getting onto a subway car and being jammed up against different bodies, but you're looking around and you're like, not one person in this car is the same as me or comes from the same, looks like me or comes from the same experience as me. And so all the things, all of that, that I love the most about the city was stripped away because of the pandemic. And so I think a lot of artists during that time here in New York got a depressed and then B felt this pressure to like do something like yeah. put something into we're always sharing. And it was really odd for all of us to not have a community in our art or just feel like totally isolated and at home. When I was used to like, you walk into school and there's your ensemble and you're all like half naked with each other and rolling on the studio floor like that that's my New York and that's my art. Um, and so a lot of it, that time just felt in the city where it's very difficult to feel isolated. Mm -hmm. It was an incredibly isolating mm -hmm. time. Expert. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah, but, but you know, from that, you got to like, think about what is the work I want to do. There was way more highlight on like the individual as opposed to me and my ensemble, it was like, oh, I'm, I have to graduate from my ensemble. And how, how do I like carry these people with me? Cause they define so much of who I am, just like I do for them. Um, but what is like my, what is the work I want to do? And what can I envision myself doing in the next five years? What are my goals, my personal goals? How do I get there? And then all of our work was like doing self tapes and, be like mastering the art of the self tape where you, you know, have to, you have a reader, but you have to full, you get a script, you get an audition, you have to memorize it in 24 to 48 hours, Jeez. record it and like be your own director. Um, and then send it off to your management who sends it off to casting. And so perfecting that and getting comfortable with that art, um, I call it art because it's just like so it's it was a huge learning curve for me after coming from the theater where, like I said, you have six weeks to like investigate a script and to create a character. Now, all of a sudden, you know, the past year, my work has been you get an audition. OK, clock's ticking. Like, what are you going to do yeah. with how much can you change yourself and like jump into this world? But you have to do like all of that specificity you worked on at Juilliard, all of that technique and that imagination. It's just, it's all the same, but you have to infuse it in a shorter amount of time. Um, and so, uh, yeah, a lot as isolating as this time has been, it's also been like, you know, learning what that is for me and um, and taking my own time and process with it. And you're living in New York now, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I've been here um, the whole time. <laughs> wow. For better or for worse. Yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine. So you yeah. now, you know, you're able to focus a little more on the individual, like you were saying, and now you're not in school. Um, what are you working on currently? Like project so creative wise? Yeah, there's, there's the tapes, which is like, that's my work. Um, but then they come and go. There's like weeks where 
there might be like a tape I need to crank out every single day mm -hmm. or an audition I need to do or like a meeting or a callback. And so there can be weeks where like every day is infused with that. And then there's weeks where like you might not have anything. And so how do you fill that time? How, like we were talking about, how do you hold yourself accountable? Yes, yes. So like still being a creator and an art maker and now it's like on you it's like i don't have to do this when you're auditioning it's someone else's vision that nice. you're you know you're like on board with and you're game to meet but when when there's no auditions on the horizon or when it's just me and my time i really this has been a huge lesson in accountability and holding myself responsible for like emma you're also a writer hi, like there's the writer part of you wants to come out and Emma, you also love to sketch like, hi, I'm still here. I'd still love to like right. practice that. Um, and so I, I think just as a, and this is something I've known about myself for a long time, but I'm very, I'm, I think I'm, I can acknowledge I'm good at planting seeds of things and fostering beginnings and, getting excited about like something new and change. And like, that is where I rest really easily. And where I find the most joy in the process is the beginning. And that like, that spark and that meeting moment where you have this idea and it's your own and you're planning out how to see it through. And you're like, I got this. And then, you know, life happens or like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm working at a Montessori school, which is my full-time job that's a time commitment. Then the auditions, that's a time commitment. Um, and you know, may, and, and you make up excuses for yourself or you get distracted. And so there's a lot of things I started when I was at Juilliard, um, because I, I think it was easy to start a lot of those extra processes. Um, mm -hmm because I was surround, I was in a school surrounded by people performing at that 110%. And so you just never, you never want to get lazy or like not see something through. Yeah. You can't um, afford, you can't afford to get lazy. Yeah. And so I started, I took this awesome creative writing class and I started a manuscript. Um, and it's this like creative nonfiction piece, this, long narrative poem kind of and like a collection of these poems um but they read sort of like short stories and i called it unbridled and i like yes. really tweaked away at it my third year of school and that winter and that summer i sent it off to a lot of writing contests but it was never finished like it was something i got jazzed by and Still, I'm like, you know, I was reading it before this call since we talked about it the other day. And I was like, I need, this is just something I, God, I need to finish this. And then, like, I, I can't jump myself. Like, I need to really put the time and the work into it before I share it with the world. Um, and then there's some art projects like this. I told you I was making this sketch of my sister that I'm going to paint. Um, and that my time at, at school, I would always do like paintings for friends or like commission work. Um, so for my friend Jalen's birthday, he sent me this photo of like me and our two other classmates just flat out asleep on the subway train. And he was like, I want you to paint this for me. And so I painted it in oil and gave it to him for his birthday. Like those kind of things I love to do, but, yeah. um, for whatever reason, I just like really struggle with seeing seeing them through if I'm not being held accountable. But then I can't expect other people to hold me accountable. I have to do that for myself, especially in this time. Yeah, that's a big a big concept, really, is being holding yourself accountable. And I think any 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 creative would say that it's super easy to get excited about and and like see and feel that initial spark of starting something and then finishing it you know it's almost like you're your own worst enemy and in a way you know it's like just trying to 
bring everything together. Like if I was making a song or working on a song, it's amazing to start it and you know you've got all these different people giving you input and stuff, but finishing it is like when do you when do you like even know? <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. it's just part of the again, it's part of the process, the whole creative process. But do you your unbridled uh, manuscript you were telling us about, do you have like, uh, are you close to being finished with it? Or how, how is that? What's the battle with that? Like, or, or is have you just not looked into it more? It's so, yeah, I was, I was reading it before this and I, I nailed down this like issue with it is it's a lot, all of the stories are beginnings. And so mm. I've sort of strung them together as like, like it's a bunch of these, um, narrative poems strung together, but they don't, there's no beginning, middle, ending yet. It's like beautiful and narrative and true to my life and is this like nice memoir of sorts, but it doesn't have like beginning, middle, ending. And that that is the essential, like you need that in order to have a, a story that people want to read and engage with. Absolutely. Um, so I think as I work on it, um, just coming up with like, yeah, I have these descriptions and this like sweeping, you know, narration, but how do I activate it and charge it with and like put a timer on it and raise the stakes a little bit so that it can be this completed thing? Absolutely. Well, that's exciting. So yeah. the... Um, also talk a little bit about uh another program really that you uh, well this is a, a pr actual program that you got started at juilliard the exchange program tell us tell us a little bit about yeah. that yeah so after after the election i think all of us as like devastated as we so this was 2016 my first year of school oh, oh okay all right um as like we were just so devastated yeah. and as an artistic institution we also recognized as like awful as these four years are going to be with this presidency it also is going to be perhaps the greatest time for artists because we have like a lot of things to say about this and we have a lot of like it just yes, activated us in a way of like, oh, I have something to say about that. <laughs> and and so a lot of us, you know, we explored ways that we could combine our activism with our um, artistry. And one of the first um, things I like wanted to touch base with, I think like coming from Kentucky and then seeing how many um or like how red Kentucky was when they voted, a lot of people would turn to me and be like, who did you, oh, you come from Kentucky? So yeah. you probably know. And then I was like, that's just not fair because I yeah. know a lot of like the activists who work the hardest, like the communities of color in like rural Kentucky and these like coal mining towns, these families that have been there forever. I'm like, I know how hard those activists work and like just because you know you're reading these articles that were written by um urban folks about those rural areas i was like but i don't think they're crediting the amount like those little specks of blue and all of those like activist communities who like tried really hard yeah um to and had these like very difficult conversations with their communities um, and so I was curious about those people and, um, and then I got together with, um, two of my classmates in my drama class and then, um, an opera singer at the school who had done, um, work with environmentalists and activists in Appalachia and in mm -hmm. a lot of the regions I, like just outside of Huntington, West Virginia and in Eastern Kentucky. Um, and so he, we all got together and we were like, we want to investigate the conversation between the urban rural divide. And like, why do we just, why do we write off all like rural pe assume all rural people voted for 
Trump when like that's not the case or why and then why do rural people like see urban urbanites as like you know sucking up all opportunity or like what are these stereotypes we have for or against each other and how does it divide us politically how can art kind of bring us back together or like at least get us in a space where we can have a working conversation um, that's, you know, that's coming from a place of empathy. And m my biggest thing during that time was when like, you know, when I was exposed to someone who like said I voted for, or if I was talking to this person and if they admitted to voting for Trump or if they started talking about like make America great again, how my impulse was to be like, no, no. And like wanting to just erupt because of how like violent those kind of statements are. Like, are, how do you control that impulse and like actually have a conversation? Like, well, why, why did you vote for him? What did you see in his policy? Like, why, what is your experience? What are your hardships that like you would turn to um, just, you know, a monster like that and expect him to be our nation's leader. And so like, just trying to work with, you know, there was a lot of impulse to be of like, cancel culture and like, I can't, I can't engage. And as much as I participated in that cancel culture, this, um, this project was an excellent lesson and like, you know, sit in that discomfort. And how can we create like, change out of this or how can we break this down and like really observe where we're going wrong here or where we're just like you know but it was writing off rural people as like this those stereotypes when i was like i grew up around active the strongest activists i know were from eastern kentucky and um and so we went down to that first year of school. We all four went down to Whitesburg, Kentucky, and we got a grant from Juilliard um, to do this work. And then, you know, when you're working with a small community like that and you are the outsider and you came from a lot of privilege, like we were coming, we were four Juilliard students coming <laughs> from New York City. Yeah. We got a grant to come down here. How do you work with that privilege? And it's just like, white privilege like how yeah. do i acknowledge that i have this privilege and then um and then use it to lift up people of less privileged people in a less privileged yes, position instead of like separating myself or like allowing that to make me feel guilty it's like acknowledge it and then like i was saying at school it's like acknowledge that thing and then work with it like okay i I recognize like we got all this funding to come down here, but every ounce of that money is going to be for us and for like, it's going to be shared yeah. um, for the work that we want to create, not the work we want to like do for you. It's like for us to meet in a common space. Um, and so we did like potlucks with the community. We met with, this um this awesome program called ami appalachian media institute and that was like high school age students and older um who had and who were like you know some of the just the most like equitable and like like charged with like activism people and you know they're living Living in this like very small town in Appalachia, um, and so getting together with them and then creating a piece about the urban rural divide, um, and I think the one of their main concerns with like us, even us coming down there, was like, you know, people are fascinated by. Appalachia, they want to come and they want to tell our story for us. They want to come and like paint us as something that maybe we aren't. Yeah. And, you know, they're looking at, they're not, 
document um, documentaries aren't going down there to like not always going down there to document like all the activism that's happening there. They might be going down to like, you know, heighten the poverty and like, oh, look, that's why all of them believe this politically when it's like, no, not all people. Ha yeah, they come from hardship, but they didn't vote for Trump. Actually, they're like really fighting against um, against him. And so it was just really and then you know, coming from, yeah, like I said, coming from the privilege we have, there was also this thing of like the hero complex, like acknowledging there's this thing when you, I, I have a lot of privilege, like having gotten out of Kentucky and having gotten to like have a college experience out of that state and then coming back to that state to do um, artistic and um, political work. Like, how do you not fall into this hero complex where you're like I'm here to help your community to like I'm here to share what I've learned it's like no no <laughs> how do you how do you come and like just like acknowledging the experience you've had but like meeting truly in the middle and coming in with an open heart and understanding that they you know, even though I came from Huntington, they see Huntington as like this huge sp sprawling urban place full of a lot of privilege. Um, and so it was this extremely humbling and informative time. And I think, you know, we were rolling with it and wanted, certainly wanted to continue, um, but we just couldn't get any more funding from the school. And, and it's difficult organizing um, something of, that and trying to we really wanted to get the ami students we were working with to come up to juilliard and like do a show together in our space um but funding that is incredibly difficult and yeah you know we're balancing being students on top of like writing yeah it's a lot it's a lot yeah yeah and so and you know i'm here i am like making excuses for like why we didn't see this thing through and i wish it was just such an important and very relevant to who I am is, you know, the, that urban rural. Yeah. Like I've always felt teetering between those two worlds my whole life. And so it was personal. Um, Definitely. And yeah. we just met these, this amazing community, but we put all the money that we had left over kind of in the wake of this time last year of the civil rights movement happening in America and, um, and listening to black people and raising them, we um, donated all of the money we had left over to um, different groups. We donated it to Black Lives Matter Louisville um, and then a few more um, organizations by and for black people in Appalachia. Um, and I like, so it feels like it had this even if it even if that group you know even if we get together or create something similar in the next few years um i know that all of that we've planted seeds and like we've put our mission into organizations that are like doing the work right now and that are activated now more than ever yeah um so i feel confident that mission is moving forward Absolutely. And congratulations, Emma. That's that's amazing. That that whole program and that y'all did that even as a freshman for real. That's that's awesome. And it seems like the goal was really just to be as I guess you could say down to earth as possible and like really actually understand, you know, yeah. why these people are who they are and what what makes them. And that's amazing. Seriously, especially as a freshman in college. That's really awesome. And, you know, again, you know, stuff like you were saying, you know, it being it's a lot that's a lot and you know so don't don't feel like uh it was an excuse that y'all stopped because that's amazing like you said you planted seeds like that that's that's really awesome yeah and we all still stay in touch with each other well good yeah for yeah. sure so the yeah so you've done a lot in the past eight years of your life from from beginning of high school well, your whole life but for me i can say from like when I first got to high school until like now really just these eight, nine years have been just so much of really just like 
creativity and art and music and you know things like that and you know now you're still you're living in new york you've you've done so much you've got this all of this experience and what's what's the next move what you got going on what's your plans oh so you know it's it's... (laughs) same same (laughs) Same. It's like it's like that dinner table conversation of like, what are you gonna do now, Emma? And you're like, well, there's like we were talking about. There's like a cert. There's fifty percent of me, and the work I want to do. I have to sort of wait for it to come to me, and that's like the yeah. world of TV, film. You have to wait to get those auditions, and then you pour your all into it, and you know, then it goes to a lot of different tables, a lot of different opinions, and it's out of your control. Like you control your self tape, but then you have to let it go just as easily as you like took it on. Yeah. Um, so those are kind of like the unexpected parts of my career that like, you know, you bank on and you, you know, something's going to work out eventually. Like, um, or you're in process with something, but then it doesn't come out. It's not aired for another year. Um, And so there's always that, there's always that happening. And then the other half is like, like we were talking about, like, well, you know, I can't just sit around and, and wait for that part of my art to happen. What about like the part of me that loves to do devised work or that loves to um, improv with my musician friends? Like, we would at Juilliard, I had a lot of um, friends in the music departments or in jazz um, and even in classical, uh, classical music who, you know, we got on well as friends. And then we were like, hey, you know, during your lunch break, do you want to book out a practice room? And like, you can riff on the piano and I'll do some monologues and we can just like, that's improv. cool. There was all I loved, you know, exploring that muscle at school. And that's a huge passion of mine is that kind of collaboration. Um, And something you had to work hard to create at Juilliard because it it feels, when I first um, came to that school, it often felt, you felt very divided from the dancers and from the musicians because you're so, you're in this monastic study of like your thing. Um, So yeah, I love, I love that. And sometimes those opportunities come through or like um, things with um, my friend created this group called Promptus, which is this exactly that. It's like this improvisational group of composers, dancers, actors, writers um, and musicians. And when events were happening, like throughout um, the past three years, we would like get together we'd like book out a we work studio or something or some kind of performance space and then we'd create these like improvisational shows and so hopefully that will kind of um will pick up in a little bit and then there's like virtual readings and um and those kind of things but i think my so for the parts you know it's it's same for you it's like there's parts of our careers that like we can dream about and we can sort of predict. And then there's other parts that's like, you know, I just, I have no idea. And I will say, I will say yes when it comes and I will like put my all into it. But I, what I know is that I, I want to be an actor in the four years at Juilliard proved to me that I am capable and I feel well equipped and I feel like, I, my creative process is clear and defined and my only thing is I, I just don't want to be pigeonholed into one, um, performative aspect. Like I don't, I don't just, you know, my dream career would be like, you know, do reinvigorate the urban rural artist exchange and like have, you know, do, um, devised work that combines my love for politics and activism and community organizing. And then, you know, a month after that, go to an indie film that shoots in 
uh, Hawaii, I don't know. And then the next month do a, a reading for an off Broadway thing. And then, you know, the next month do uh, an improv show with like my friends and just never being tied down to one medium. Yeah. Um, and then all the while holding myself accountable to like read the books that I have on my never ending list of books I want to read and finishing the sketch and painting it and sending this manuscript somewhere. And yeah, it's through, like, the, like, yeah, exactly. It's like yeah. the, even, even like you were saying, like reading books that you want to read other various aspects of just enjoying life, you know, just cause I've been reading more too, trying to read more books yeah. and you know, things along that line, but it's all, you know, just go with the flow, I guess, especially in this, in this era with, but COVID, Apparently COVID is getting under control. I, I don't know in New York if it's like any better. Is it? I would assume it's a little better. Like yeah, COVID in I mean, general. We like my boyfriend and I are both fully vaccinated. A lot of our friends are vaccinated. Like the vaccines feel super accessible. Um, yeah. And that it seems like hospitals are doing this thing where if um, if they have extras, even if you aren't eligible right now they're just like uh oh All right, let's get her back yo <laughs> you good? there you are uh, sorry oh, yeah this time failed <laughs> that's all right but what were you saying about the vaccines and stuff um just that like yeah they feel super accessible and testing is always at the ready. Like I, there's a place just one block down where I can go and get a no swab. Um, and then outdoor things are, you know, spring is finally here and it's warmer and people are outside and, um, and out in the parks. And so it feels like the city is really coming to life again and warming up in like a safe, in a safe way. Awesome. And then, yeah, and then Broadway is, I think they're projecting to open things back up in like September. And you get a lot of hope because then you look at like, like they're going to do the Music Man on Broadway and you look up like tickets and there are tickets, like it's, it looks, you know, at least online, there are dates where a performance is supposed to happen. And yeah, that's got to be exciting. Like, so it's great. Well, good. Yeah, I, I just was just curious about what the, it, what it's like now in New York. But awesome, man, Emma. I great, great story, great discussions. It has been great having you on here. Hey, ditto. And, and it's great. It's great to see you and hear from you, and you tell your story for real. It's is really awesome. But before you go, I want to get you in the man. That fire engine's going crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, that's mine. <laughs> yeah, welcome to New York. You're fine. <laughs> So, yeah, so are you like, you got like an apartment in like downtown New York or something? Or what's I'm, it? So I'm in South Harlem. So I'm oh. right above Central Park. Nice. Yeah. I bet that's cool. I bet that's a uh, little, uh, is that expensive? No, actually. Really? Well, that's <laughs> good. Well, I mean, it's, it's expensive when I'm talking to my friends who like live in Bowling Green and they're like, yeah, I'm paying $300 for a full house like every month. I'm yeah. Just renting it. I'm like, Okay, I'm just gonna go cry. <laughs> um, but yeah, for right now, for what it is, and like for for what we have in this space, it's it's great. Awesome. Yeah. So okay. Anyways, I'm gonna get you in the lush lockdown, Emma. All right. So you, I'm gonna give hey. you ask you a couple questions. Uh, okay. Totally, a uh, totally opinion based about Louisville, and I just want you to. I just I'm always curious about what you have to what people yeah. have to say. All right. So you're in Louisville, Emma. You have ten dollars. You got. Where are you going to eat? You got nine seconds. Spinelli's. Spinelli's. Spinelli. Okay. You know okay. Spinelli? okay. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I haven't been there in a long time, but they don't they give you like the huge slices of pizza. It's awesome. It's I never liked pizza until I had to go to Spinelli's for like dinner breaks at Walden, and became obsessed. And just like the culture, like the punk music shows that would happen there, and the like naked yeah. man on the wall like it was just always yeah. a fun time <laughs> it's definitely like a funky environment yeah all right all right good answer good answer okay second question best mm, the best venue 
in Louisville to see a show? You got nine seconds. Oh, Palace Theater. Okay, now, yeah. see, that's what I was thinking. A, a lot of a lot of people will say that, or like, um, the Mercury Ballroom. I think Mercury Ballroom is more for yes. like music performances. I don't. I've never been to the Mercury Ballroom, but why do you like the Palace? Whoops. Why do you Why do you like the Palace so oh, much? I. It's just like it's that old world like stuff. When you go, you're like, I'm seeing. I'm about to have like. I'm about to be transported somewhere yeah and it, it's just so like old school and lovely i think i saw ben so lee there and um oh. oh i saw uh ed sheeran there when i was like a big one direction fan and they were always hyping up ed sheeran um yeah. and it was just a lovely like acoustic concert um and probably some more things there that i can't remember but i just yeah. always feel like transported there yeah all right all right yeah that that is definitely a cool i've been there tw twice i think to see a couple of shows it's super cool setting and like the the big pillars and stuff like that it's it's like a nice super cool super cool place all right all right last question emma best park in louisville you got nine seconds um <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot three tom sawyer two, okay. which is a really random answer okay yeah but tom sawyer has like these um it was like the first park that i went to in louisville i remember and like there's there's like the main loop and like everyone does that loop but i would always run in there's like a little forest area and like i'd see deer I would see turkey. I saw a wild dog once, like almost got chased down. Like just uh -oh. exciting. It felt like being out in like rustic nature, even though it's like a 30 minute drive outside of downtown. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I uh, Tom Sawyer is not far from where my parents live. Yeah. Well, I didn't spend too much time out there. I went there some, but the, the parks that I went to, I don't even know. I guess like, I spent a good amount of time at Cherokee the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, Seneca, Seneca probably. Seneca Park over by in St. Matthews. But Yes. Yeah, I never spent too much time at Tom Sawyer. But it is a very big park. A lot of cool trails and stuff like that. Yeah. I'd go to Seneca for like night runs because yeah, they, they have, have that the, huge. Like, yeah. Yeah, and they have the lights. And then you can cross over to Cherokee on like the bridge or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for cross country practice, I remember doing that. Yeah, for sure. Well, Emma, I cannot thank you enough for coming on here and being part of Lush Louisville episode 27. It's been amazing to have you and hearing your story and your growth, growing as an artist from when, when you were in your imaginary worlds to when you're, <laughs> when you're graduated Juilliard living in New York, it's amazing. And I've had a couple of people text me already and they were saying that I love her story. So that's uh Oh uh, awesome. Yeah, so I really appreciate you coming on here and uh uh any any final thoughts, closing closing comments? Um I don't know. I think like talking on here, thank you so much for having Absolutely. me. Like Absolutely. I think what you're doing for like young artists in Louisville, like this is just essential. It's like highlighting us and our stories because we're all we're just all over the world. Like, yeah, everybody's like, in different places now from when we knew yeah. each other in high school. And that we just wouldn't, you know, Louisville is such a special and changing um, artistic community. And I think it's like taught all of us to be the art, to cultivate like the artists we are today. Um, and yeah, how, how wonderful that city is. Absolutely. Yeah. And we where can we connect with you i've got your instagram pulled up here it's just emma fitz is yes. that you do you use instagram a lot it looks like I, it. yeah probably Insta you know i try to do my like stay off of it until saturday but I feel <laughs> like that. So, social media saturday <laughs> yeah yeah like social saturday you know, stuff it can become like a you know yeah i i i try to i actually delete my instagram every now like more frequently now because it's just like 
I'm done with this for a while. Yeah. Just, you know, it's just, it can, it can be you a know, bad your brain habit. cells. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Just sit there scrolling is like, nah. Yeah. But. Yeah, but probably that. And then I'm on Facebook, but say I probably use Instagram more. I probably hop on there more. What's your Facebook? Is it just Emma Fitzer Price? Yeah. Emma, okay. Yeah. Two and last there, names. Yeah. And there's a P. <laughs> there's a P before the F in Fitzer Price yeah. if you can't, if y'all yeah. can't see that. Just Pop Fitzer. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, Emma, again, thank you so much. And thank uh, you. yeah, just uh, tell your friends about this. And, you know, I'll send you the video. The video will be available shortly on the YouTube channel, the link that I sent you. And um, yeah, keep doing your thing and stay in touch. It's really good to hear from you and get your story. I'm glad yeah. you, we can make this work. Yes. Go forth and make great art. Yes, go forth and, <laughs> and make great art. Shout out to GSA. Yeah. So, all right, Emma. Well, you be safe. Have a great rest of your Saturday on the beautiful you, in the beautiful sun that I am not getting to experience. It's uh, currently still thundering here, so uh, shaking my head. Dance in the rain. The day. <laughs> it's still a great day. I'm gonna go dance in the rain. <laughs> all right, Emma. You be safe. Okay. Great to see you. you. Too. All right. We'll talk soon. Good to see you. Yep. Bye bye. Bye. Man great episode always good to have emma or talk to emma super inspiring great to see her let's uh yeah so again i'm, I'm gonna have this episode available shortly i'm gonna do a little editing on it uh it'll be available tonight but again yeah follow emma stay in touch with her she's obviously doing a lot got a lot of things going on and uh yeah that's all I've got for this week. Um, episode 28, I'll be gone. I'll be in Florida next Saturday, so next week we're not doing the podcast. I'll be back uh, the week of the April 10th will be episode 28. And, yeah, i got a couple couple cool guests to wrap up the last three weeks of Lush Louisville Season 3. So stay, on, stay in touch with me for that. Um, I'm going to get this email list thing figured out, and, yeah, just stay up to date with me on my Instagram. And, yeah, appreciate everybody tuning in, too. Uh Yes, Sarsky.